the different types of energy transformations. We need to know what is the transformation to solve the problems. So this person lifting, what is the energy transformation going on there? What would be the initial form of energy? Barbells on the ground. Chemical energy from what? From herself, right? Chemical energy in her. She lifts the thing up. What's the final energy? Potential energy. She's taken it. So the transformation is chemical to potential. Lifted the thing up. What about this one? That was San Francisco. Chemical to kinetic. So let's say, okay, we, if we think down at the, at the molecular level, chemical energy in him running, kinetic into sliding. What else? What's another energy transformation there? Aha, uh -huh, it goes into thermal, right, because of the friction on the ground. So kinetic energy running turned into thermal energy. There's a hundred different ways you can talk about this. What about this one, a fire burning? Chemical energy turned into? Is it, it could be thermal and, or light, right? Any number of them. What about this one? So what was the, what was the process here? Well, spring energy, converting him in, into kinetic energy as he begins to move, right? And ultimately he's going to get to potential energy, and then back to chemical energy, I mean kinetic energy as he starts to fall back down. So you have to think about what, what, what the different transformations are so that we know where we're going. What happens, where's the beginning, where's the end, what happened in between? Hey, right. because we live in physics land, we're going to restrict ourselves to just the mechanical energy. And we're going to restrict ourselves even more. We're just going to deal with kinetic and, and gravitational potential. We're not going to deal with springs. Just because we don't have enough time. <laughs> but recognize the ideas here will apply there. We're just simplifying our life. As long as I'm within my system, I have what's called conservation of energy. So the formula is energy initial equals energy final. That is the formula. My energy in the beginning equals my energy in the final. That's what the law of conservation of energy tells me. Now, I have to look at the problem. Just like F equals MA, I have to look at the problem and decide. We're going to restrict ourselves to two kinds of energy, kinetic and gravitational potential energy. So I have to write down what is my initial kinetic energy state what is my initial potential energy state? And then what is my final kinetic energy state? What is my final potential energy state? That's the formula. You have to look at the problem and decide what these things are. You start with this and then decide what are the two forms here? What are the two forms there? Sometimes, you know, this may be zero and then this ends up as zero later. So some of these things may be zero, some of these things may not be zero. So that's in an isolated system. An isolated system is one where we are just staying inside the system and we have no external things acting from the outside. No, when we get to thermal physics, then we'll talk about it. But right now we're just dealing with this. So we have... So an isolated system, there's, there's a, one other concept we need to think about when something is isolated. We have these ideas of a conservative force and a non-conservative force. A conservative force, so if I have forces in play, a conservative force is something that I can get back. So gravity is a conservative force. If I take my object and I lift it up, 
took a certain amount of energy to lift this thing up. If I let it go, I can get that energy back. So it goes up, took energy to lift it, I let it go, it comes back down. And I get back what I put into it. It also means it's path independent. So if I take this thing here and I lift it and I go around back and forth like this and get it to this height, that path is irrelevant to how much energy it took to lift it up. I just went from here to here, that's the energy. That I put into it, the energy I take out is what it came back. So it's path independent. So gravity is a classic example of a conservative force. Conserve. The energy is conserved as I do, as I apply that force. I get it back. A non-conservative force is path dependent and you can't reverse and get back what you put in. Classic example is friction. Friction is a non-conservative force. It is path dependent, friction is, right? If I take this thing and I slide it around on top of the table, I'm going to go more friction than going a shorter path, right? It is path dependent. And I can't, you know, I can't like drive around here, get all the friction, and then turn around and go back the other direction and get back that loss of friction, right? Friction, it takes and never gives back. So that's a non-conservative force. If I'm dealing with non-conservative forces, then I can't use this equation. So if I have a problem, a, a rock sliding down a hill and friction's in play, energy is conserved ultimately in the universe, but I need to use something different. But if I'm dealing with just lifting things up and gravity and I'm ignoring friction or air resistance, then I can use this, which is energy initial equals energy final. Now, if I think a little bit though, sometimes I can use this with friction, figure out what it was, and then the difference is what was lost to friction. Just like we did in the previous problems in our other homework, like the shooting the arrow. We used as if there was no air resistance and it said 37% or something, I think the loss was, there's a homework problem. Used as if there was no air, and then subtracted out what it told you the percentage it lost. So the same kind of idea can be played here. So do we understand the difference between a conservative and a non-conservative force? Friction, you just you don't get back what you lost to friction. That's non-conservative. That's my thing here. All right, so if I'm in an isolated system with, non, with conservative forces, then I can just use energy initially equals energy final, conservation of energy. Write out what these are. But if I have external forces and or non-conservative forces in play, then I use a different energy equation. The different energy equation is the change in energy equals the amount of work. The change in energy equals the amount of work. So what does that mean? How do I use that? What, what's the change in energy? That's very similar. Well, what does delta mean? The change in. How do I write delta E? E final minus E initial, right? Equals work. Delta anything is final minus initial. Energy final minus energy initial. I may need to use this up here to figure out what the energy is available. May or may not need to. Sometimes you'll be given things. Sometimes you can calculate it in other ways. Now, but if I have an E final minus E initial and I have two different forms of energy, it actually is delta K plus delta U equals the amount of work. So this is big W, is the amount of work. That was the work that was done on the system or work done by the system, i.e. the loss of energy in or out. 
And then this would be kinetic final minus kinetic initial plus potential final minus potential initial equals the amount of work. So do you see how this gets a little more complicated, right? It's no, you have to actually think and figure out what these different things are. The formula is this, this one and this one here. That's the only two formulas. You create the rest of it by the problem, by thinking about the situation. Any questions? We'll make a little more sense, hopefully, when we get to actually solving some problems. All right, kinetic and potential energy, what are they, mathematically? Kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. One-half times the mass of the object times its velocity squared. <coughs> that is the kinetic energy. Ener the units of them are joules. So one joule is one newton per one newton meter. If you actually figure out, so you have this thing here is actually a kilogram times a meter per second squared, squared, right? And what was a newton? A newton was from e equals m a. So that's kilogram times a meter per second squared, right? So if I put this in the same state, that's kilogram meter per second squared times a meter. That's a newton times a meter. That's where it came from. Potential energy. Potential energy is mgy. Sometimes I will use mgh, where h is the height above. So y and h is measuring the height above its minimum point. Minimum point is the bottom of where it can go. It's not necessarily the lowest point in our visual field. It's the lowest point that that thing can get to, is minimum height. From that height up is what h is. Kinetic and potential are a little bit more subtle than than just this formula indicates. So if I have an object flying along and it's moving, it's easy to see that it's moving, it's easy to see that the kinetic energy is tied up in the thing itself. It's moving. It has kinetic energy. Potential energy is not necessarily the same. So I take this object, I'm holding it up right here. It has a certain amount of potential energy. If I take the object and put it here, does it have the same potential energy? Yes or no? It's different potential energy, right? Why does it have different potential energy? Because what height is different? What is y? From the minimum? to wherever it is, right? What's the minimum here? This is the minimum now, right? It can't get to the ground, the table's here. So it has a different Y. I'm over here, I have the, that Y. So is the potential energy stored in that object? Because did the object really change? Did really anything change with the object? Kinetic energy, if I go faster, if the object itself goes faster, it has more kinetic energy. But with potential energy, here or here, there's really no difference with the object. So where is the potential energy? Kinetics in the object, where's the potential energy? So where it's located or, I can't hear you. In the environment, it's in, in this relationship, right? That's where the potential energy is. It's in the relationship. That it, so it's a little harder to, it's not as tangible of where it is. Hey, here's a question. So I look at this problem. We're going to set up the equation here. So part of the challenge is just setting up 
the problem. Once we have the problem set up, the math is easy. A car sits at rest at the top of a hill. A small push sends it rolling down a hill. After its height has dropped by five meters, it is moving at a good clip. Write down the equation of conservation of energy, noting the initial and final states of what energy transformation has taken place. Hey. So we're in physics land with this problem, which means no air resistance, and we're going to ignore friction right now for this problem. So where's our picture? Here's our picture. Car, hill, right? Here's my car. The thing tells me conservation of energy. I'm going to have to do something with conservation of energy. What is the equation for conservation of energy? What is the equation for conservation of anything? Energy initial equals energy final. Conservation of energy is initial equals final. Conservation of momentum, when we get to that, will be momentum initial equals momentum final. That's what it means. Conservation laws mean initial equals final. We're almost out of time here, so we, what that tells me is I have to be able to draw my picture of the initial and the final state now. Initial state, it's up here. Final state, it's somewhere down the hill, right? So this is my initial, this is my final, and then I have to, we'll pick up from this on the next class, I have to write down what is the state here, what is the state here. Okay, we'll pick up from that on month. what day is it today? On Friday. Have a good Halloween.